Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church. It's good to be with you here in God's house, where we can continue our celebration of Jesus' resurrection from the dead on this first Sunday after Easter as we gather around God's word and sacrament and the Holy Spirit strengthens our faith through that means of grace and we can praise our Father in heaven together as well. For those of you I haven't met, my name is Nick Schmaller. I'm, I'm currently a professor at Martin Luther College in New, in New Ulm and it's my privilege to lead you in worship here this morning. The series theme for these Sundays after Easter is Resurrection Reality. And in this first Sunday after Easter, we're going to look at the reality of the fact that Jesus has truly risen from the dead, that he lives, but also how his resurrection affects our realities that we live in each and every day. So that will be the focus of our readings and our sermon today as well. We'll begin our uh, worship with an uh, opening hymn, Come You Faithful, Raise the Strain, and may God bless your worship.
Please stand as you are able. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me. A sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. 
O risen Lord, you came to your disciples and took away their fears with your word of peace. Come to us also by word and sacrament and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading for this Sunday is from the book of Acts, verses from chapter 18. Here we see the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys, and we see him enter the city of Corinth. And although he preached the message of Jesus died and resurrected, he was met with opposition and persecution. But because of the reality of Jesus' resurrection, God appeared to him in a vision and said, you have no need to fear, because Jesus lives and he is with you at all times, and so he would be his abiding presence even as he preached a message that was rejected by some. Many more came to faith and believed that Jesus too was their Lord, risen from death. Let's read these words from Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia... Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. The word of the Lord. Be Second reading for this Sunday is from the book of 1 John, the first verses from that letter. As we read these opening verses, we hear an echo of John's gospel where it talks about how Jesus is true God there from the beginning. But the start of this letter, John is encouraging all of us and all of his readers by saying that he, was, with the rest of the disciples, had seen and touched Jesus with their own eyes and hands seen him as true God in all the miracles he performed, and even more, saw him resurrected from the dead. And as eyewitnesses, they have testified to us, the hearers now thousands of years later, to the fact that Jesus truly does live. Let's read these words from 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. The word of the Lord. Please rise as you are able to join in the gospel acclamation. Gospel for this Sunday is from the Gospel of John, verses from chapter 20, the account of Jesus appearing to his disciples and then also to Thomas, 
This will serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. We read. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you. You may be seated for the singing of our next hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What more could Jesus have done? That at times is the question that goes through my mind when I think about this account of Jesus' disciples locked in that upper room after the three days after Jesus' crucifixion. I think to myself, was it not enough that Jesus had given them all of these miracles, these miraculous signs to demonstrate the kind of power that Jesus had? What more could Jesus have done than to show that he even has power over death? What more could he have done that when one time when he was asked for a sign, he said, I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah, that just as Jonah was in the belly of a great fish for three days, so the Son of Man is going to be in the belly of the earth for three days, but will rise again. Or once when he had said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up again. What more could Jesus have done to prepare them for what was going to happen? Or maybe you say to yourself, well, that, those were metaphors, that there's imagery. Well, what about the times when Jesus said, in plain words, so that there was no misunderstanding, the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the leaders of the people to be betrayed and suffer and crucified. But on the third day, I will rise again. It's not that the disciples didn't hear it. After all, they rebuked Jesus for saying that he would go into their hands and be crucified, but it's almost like they forgot the second part of Jesus' promise, that he would rise again. What more could Jesus do to prepare them for the trials that were going to come when Jesus would be crucified so that they would have confidence and assurance to meet the adversity that would come their way? What else could he do? You know, and when you think about it, the disciples were very prepared for what was going to happen. And they even said so and acted that way with many of their words and actions throughout Jesus' ministry. The disciples spoke with confidence and confessed who Jesus was so many times in the Gospels. And even among them, Thomas was one of the ones who, even though we have very few words of his recorded in the Gospels, that spoke with confidence when it came to following Jesus. Thomas has mentioned any time there is a list of the disciples, but really outside of the account that we read here this morning, just twice do we hear Thomas speak. But when he does, man, there's confidence in his words. One time is when Jesus was with his disciples as Lazarus was sick and dying. And Jesus finally corrects his disciples' misunderstandings when he had said that Lazarus was just sleeping because to Jesus, he can talk about death as sleep because he promises to raise those who are connected to him to life again, even in death. But to make it clear to his disciples, he said to them, he is not sleeping, Lazarus is dead. And what did Thomas say in response to that? He said, let us go with him so that we may die with him. <coughs> Such confidence in what Jesus could do and willing to even follow him, even if it meant Thomas was going to follow him, to his death. Or just a few days later, on Maundy Thursday, when we have lots of Jesus' instructional words recorded for us in the Gospel of John, Jesus had said to his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to go away, but I'm preparing a place for you, and I'll come back to take you to be with me, and you know the way of where I'm going. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know the way, but show us the way, tell us the way, so that we can follow you. And then Jesus replied, I am the way and the truth and the life. What more could Jesus have done to prepare them for what was going to happen? And as I said, the disciples were prepared and spoke as if they were prepared many times throughout his ministry. So what changed? What changed that made it so now they had locked themselves in this upper room for fear of the people who did the very thing that Jesus promised that they were going to do? What had changed? Well, reality had hit them. They saw with their own eyes what they had done to Jesus, this, this brutal crucifixion. They saw him lifeless on the tree, and they saw him laid into a tomb. And so for their perception of the reality, everything seemed to be different. Their whole world had changed. Fear took hold of their hearts. It shouldn't have. After all, they had Jesus' promises. It shouldn't have, but, but it did. Do you ever find yourself in the same place? 
that we have lots of promises and assurances from God's word, and yet still, if you're like me, there probably are times when fear takes hold of you. Is it at times because of the consequences of living in a sinful world when you're dealing with things like sickness or death or separation or heartache? Well, hear Jesus' words again. What more could he do but promise us that if God loves you so dearly that he'd not spare even his own son, well, how will he not also give you all good things when Jesus promises nothing can ever separate you from the love of God? He's trying to speak to that fear that can come into our lives. Does an uncertain future, does that sometimes trouble or concern? It's true, we don't know what the next days will hold for us, but here's what we do know, that all things are in God's hands, and your name has been engraved in the book of life because he has chosen you to be his own, and he knows even all the very hairs on your head, even though we don't know our plans, God does, and because they're God's plans, we know they're for our eternal good. He speaks to that fear. Do temptations continue to come at you and make it feel like it'll always just be bombarded by this leading astray from what God and his path is for you? Well, hear Jesus' words that speak directly to that. He does warn us that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, but he saw, saw Satan fall like lightning. He has already crushed the devil's head through his death on the cross his doom is sealed, and he promises no one can snatch you out of his hand. So do not fear the devil. Trust in the Lord. These are the promises that Jesus had given to his disciples, the promises that he gives to us to make it so that when fear does threaten our lives, that we can look instead to God's promises and not be fearful. And yet for the disciples... Their reality, what they saw with their eyes, made it so that fear gripped their hearts. And so what did Jesus do? What more could he do? He came with a new reality, the, the real reality, the resurrection reality. In that locked up room there, all of a sudden, Jesus was standing right there in the midst. He shows them the nail marks in his hands, the hole in his side, he promises to breathe on them the gift of the Holy Spirit, and it gives them the keys to the kingdom of, the heaven, kingdom of heaven. Two times he proclaims, peace be with you, because Jesus knew exactly what was troubling their hearts. What more could Jesus have done to show them that they had no reason to fear, not on this day or any day afterwards, because Jesus lives? What more could Jesus do? Nothing. So that when Thomas came to join those disciples... And the first thing out of their mouths was, we have seen the Lord. They couldn't say anything else, had nothing else that was ever going to be on their minds again, except Jesus lives. He's risen from the dead. What fear could hold their hearts anymore? But for Thomas, it wasn't quite enough. And we're not sure why. Was it his rationalism, his sensibilities, that even if all of his closest friends had testified with our very own eyes and hands, we have seen the Lord he wasn't quite ready to believe. So what more could Jesus do? Well, he did exactly what he needed to. A week later, now when Thomas is there, does the exact same thing, appears in their midst, and says to Thomas, look, touch me. Put your finger in my hands. Put your hand in my side. Stop doubting and believe. What more could Jesus do? to win back his disciples from fear of persecution and fear of enemies. Jesus did everything he could to make sure that they knew what peace really was. And so what did Thomas reply? What could he say? Just these few words. My Lord and my God. Few words, but oh, so powerful. Because it encapsulates exactly who Jesus is. That Jesus is Lord. He is the one that is master and controller of all things. And all the events that he said were going to happen, they did, just as Jesus had promised. But not only is he in control of all things, but that he's in control of all things for Thomas good, my Lord. And you're good too. My God, he is righteousness and perfection embodied there in man. 
that his righteousness has become ours through his death on the cross, and death which came into the world through man had been crushed by this man, God, Jesus. And he had done it all for Thomas and for you too. And so what more can we say than say what Thomas said too? In spite of all of this evidence that God has given us, we say he is my Lord and my God too. And because Jesus lives and we are connected to him, he promises that we will live eternally as well. What more could Jesus do to calm our hearts? And even in just this one confession that Thomas gives us, there is so much for us to explore. There's even more in Jesus' words that speak directly to us to comfort us in times of trouble in each and every day. Let me use this as an illustration about what Jesus is doing in this account. Have you ever stood at the edge of something that is just so massive in this world that God has created that it really just, it just takes your breath away? I think of the first time that I stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon and just seen pictures of it before, but you just really cannot comprehend how massive that is. Those who have been there know exactly what I'm saying. Over a mile deep, at points 18 miles wide, 250 miles long. You can't, you can't see it all. You can't comprehend it all. It's just so massive. Or maybe you stood at the foothill of mountains before, and you look up into the sky, and you can't even see the tops. They're covered by the clouds. This world, it is massive and impressive, which God has created for us to enjoy. And at the foot of these things that are so great, it's easy to feel so small at times. Now I want you to consider, in contrast, this pool ball. It's a smaller pool ball, one that my kids play with in a small pool table at our house. But I've read and, and checked it a couple times, and it's going to boggle your minds, but this is true. As smoothly as this ball can roll across the table, even if we're not always accurate, it still rolls smoothly across the table. That proportionally, even though this is more spherical than the earth, this is actually rougher than the earth proportionally than the, all the peaks and valleys that exist in this world. That if we were to expand this pool ball to the size of the earth, there would be higher mountains and deeper valleys than those that are so massive we can hardly comprehend it here in this world. How does that make you feel? That if we look at this world and these things seem so massive, and yet to our perspective, a pool ball seems so smooth yet is more rough than even the earth? Man, it just boggles the mind. And if you really take it all to heart, it can make us feel so small, insignificant if we were to picture ourselves, the size that we would have to be on a pool ball to actually make it seem like there are mountains there. So small, insignificant. And then you put our Earth in our solar system, in our galaxy, in the universe. Oof, right? Boggles the mind. Have you ever felt like that in life? Insignificant, small. Sometimes it feels like you can go through a whole day and through our normal activities of the day and it maybe seems like you could do it without anybody even noticing. And we have the same events that take place each and every day and they can seem like, what is it all for? What are we actually doing? And even when you think about the confession of Thomas and the titles that were given to Jesus, my Lord, and my God, I mean, even those titles are so big that he's in control of all things, all the universe, and we are just this very small part of it. It can all seem so impersonal, just too big. Well, that's what's so important about what happened in this text. Consider Thomas once more. Listed with the disciples several times in the Gospels, but really we don't know much about him. A couple other times that his words were recorded that we had mentioned already, but even his name, Thomas, it's Aramaic, Didymus, it means the same thing, it means twin. You know, probably we don't even actually know his name. This had to be a nickname, which, which parent is going to name their child twin, right? So we probably don't even know his own name. And so how did Thomas feel when all of the rest of the disciples had seen Jesus? There have been other times when he was with them all, but it was this time when he wasn't with them, that Jesus showed himself to all of them. And maybe it was that he was too rational, too sensible to believe it. But maybe also he was thinking to himself, why wasn't, why wasn't I there? Was I too insignificant, too small? No, unless I see him with my own eyes, I'm just not going to believe. Well, what did Jesus do? He went 
And he showed himself to his disciples again, and this time he turned right to Thomas. Put your finger in. Put your hand in my side. Jesus would not let Thomas go through life unnoticed, unmentioned. He needed him to know that he was alive because he had already claimed him as his own for eternity. Jesus cared too much about each individual, as massive as this world is. He cared too much about Thomas to let him go on doubting and not believing that Jesus had lived and risen for him. And now maybe you're saying to yourself, well, that's great for Thomas. But what about us? That we haven't seen Jesus with our own eyes. We haven't been able to put our fingers in his hands or our hand in his side. But Jesus, he was thinking about you on that day too. Because even as he's still speaking to Thomas and he says, because you have seen, you have believed. Even as he's still speaking to Thomas' ears, his next words are for you. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Everyone in that room had seen him. And it's not like they weren't blessed. Of course they are, and they are blessed eternally at the risen Savior's side in heaven. But his next words were for you because he knew that years later and decades later, thousands of years later, that there would be those that are gathered here today who have not seen him with their own eyes. And what does Jesus say about you? You're blessed. You're blessed because the Spirit has worked in you the confidence that Jesus does live, that through the testimony of those that he had appeared to in the flesh, now he has recorded that for our posterity so that we know that Jesus does live, not just with one eyewitness, but with hundreds, to testify that Jesus has conquered death. And so you're blessed because Jesus said so, because the Spirit has convinced you that Jesus lives. And then he goes on, not, not with his own lips, but still as much, very much Jesus' words through the inspiration of the Apostle John when he says, and all of this, this is written for this reason, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who was promised, the only one that could save, that he is the Son of God, the one who has power to conquer death, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Don't think that we can go through this world unnoticed by our all-powerful and all-seeing God. Even just days after his resurrection, he had in mind those that would come thousands of years later, us who are gathered here today. And he had it all recorded for us for this reason, so that you may believe. Because by believing, just as surely as Jesus lives and reigns, his promise is true. By believing, you too have life in his name. Amen. Now, may this peace of God, which transcends all understanding, may that guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand now as you're able as we join in confessing our Christian faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the responsive prayer of the church.
Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. <coughs> Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you who now rest from their labors. We pray especially for Orman Reynolds and his family as he passed away this past Wednesday. We give you thanks that you made him yours through holy baptism and have now given him the crown of life. We pray that you may console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. We'll now gather our offerings to the Lord. If you haven't done so yet, you can please fill out one of those blue connection cards. You can place that in the offering basket as well.
Please stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give. Thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who by his willing sacrifice on the cross took away the sins of the world, and by his glorious resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Oh. Thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate word conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us to, together to receive your son's body and blood. Send us your spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, it broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
truly saying. Now may the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for our singing of our closing hymn. Good morning again, everyone. Good to be with you here in God's house. Good to be able to celebrate the resurrection of uh, Jesus once more as we go through this season of Easter. I was asked to make a, a few announcements for this coming week. Uh, first, just uh, to keep in your prayers the, the family of Orman Reynolds as he had passed away this past week, uh, announcing the, the funeral is on Friday, April 12th at Woodland Hills Chapel, visitation at noon and the funeral at 1 o'clock. A couple other things going on uh, after the late service today. There's a uh, a pastoral uh, call meeting, a discussion for if you should go to the assignment committee to get a graduate from the seminary, what that would look like, as well as an actual pastoral call meeting to call once more from the field before that uh, tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. A uh, couple other things about Risen Savior School. On, uh, I didn't write it down. I think it's Monday that there's a fundraiser for uh, the Crooked Pint from 5 to close or 5 to 11. And there's a, a flyer on the table back there where 15% of your total uh, from, the, from that restaurant would go to the Risen Savior School. So if you're interested in finding a meal for Monday, you can uh, look at that. And then finally, there's an open house on Thursday, April 11th, from 5, 5 to 6.30 for Risen Savior uh, School as well. Uh, this is not like a re-registration for next year, although uh, parents that have their children in that school already are certainly welcome that this is uh, geared towards uh, new families. And so if you know of anybody that might be interested uh, here to see their school and uh, the classrooms and the blessing of a Christ-centered education, there uh, on Thursday from 5 to 6.30 is that open house. Those were, I think, all the announcements I had looking at Pastor Nelson. He says, I did well with that, so that's great. Got the approval. Uh, God's blessings to all of you here on this coming week.